Welcome back to the channel everyone and today we are going to be going over how to soft mod your stock HS5 Deluxe Arcade 1UP. We're going to be going over everything that you're going to need, how to do it, and how to set up your two player controls. The great thing about this setup is that it actually boots into the emulator front end just as if it were stock. This gives you a lot of flexibility when it comes to customization. You can theme it however you want, and you can even give it a stock look if you really want. So what are we gonna need to do this? Let's take a look and see what you will need. If you don't have them, you're gonna need a 32 gigabyte SanDisk memory card and a wireless mouse and keyboard combo. I'll leave links in the descriptions for the ones that I use because I know those ones work for sure. You're also gonna need some patience to get through this process it's not hard, but you do have to pay attention to what you're doing. And you're going to need to download the file packs that I've created. I haven't included any ROMs with this pack, but I have included the file substructure so that you guys don't have to worry about doing that part. First things first, pull off the back panel of your arcade one up and place the micro SD card in the slot at the top of the PCBA. Then make sure to plug in your USB adapter to the bottom port. Once you've done that, go ahead and turn on your machine. Your machine should be booting up into the stock arcade one-up menu, and to get out of there, you're going to press the Windows and L key at the same time. This is going to take you into the calendar. From there, you should see three dots in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. Go ahead and click those, and then go to Settings. From there, you're going to want to go and select Choose Ringtone. In the upper right-hand corner of the screen, you will see a search icon. Click that and then go ahead and type in the search bar S-E-T-T. -T. Then you're going to want to click on the green Settings App icon and click Open. From here, you're going to go to Storage and then you are going to select your SD card and click Format. You want to make sure that you format it for file transfers. Everything will pretty much be drag and drop, so let's get started. First things first, make sure you've downloaded the files, then insert your memory card into your computer or your SD card slot. We're going to unrare our files and take a quick look at the directories. You should have a total of four directories if you include the ROMs folder, but the ROMs folder is gonna go into the root directory of your SD card. In the link that I've included in the description, when you unrare it, this is what you'll have. This will be your file structure and you'll have all the APK files needed for the duration of the tutorial. Whatever arcade one up APKs that you choose to use, you're going to want to use pre-cloned APKs. This just makes the install process quick and easy. Now again, the ROMs will not be included, but this is the file substructure that you will need and that will be included, as well as the BIOS files that you will need for the setup. This is what your file substructure should look like before you eject your SD card and reinsert it into your arcade one up. To ensure your SD card is seated properly, make sure you press down firmly. Now again, you're gonna be in your stock arcade one up menu, but from here, we're gonna hit the Windows and L key again, which will take us back into the calendar and we will go through the same process we did earlier to get back into settings. At this point, once we get to settings, we want to search build. This should pull up build number and from there we want to click that. You're going to want to scroll down to build number and click on that until it says that developer mode has been unlocked. To back out of any menu, you're just going to press your right mouse key. Back out of settings and go down to system. Click advanced and then click developer options. From there, you're going to scroll down until you find force allow apps on external. Once you've selected that, go ahead and back out to settings and select storage. If you formatted your SD card properly, you should be seeing it there. Go ahead and select it and it'll take us into the file menu. And anytime that these apps, including the file system, are asking for permissions, just give it all of the permissions. Okay, so from here, we're gonna go to our pre-cloned apps folder and we are going to install whichever arcade one up apps that we would like to have on there. For example, Yoga Flame or Big Blue. All you need to do is click on the respective app and then give it the permission to install. I won't be doing a shortcut tutorial for these, but it is not difficult to do. 
although there's really no reason for it since you can select each of these as a home app. Here's a list of the apps that you should have and will need for this process. And this part's really easy. All you're gonna do is go ahead and install each one in the order that you select them in. Once you've installed all your APKs, go ahead and back out of storage, go into settings and select apps and notifications. From there, you're going to wanna to scroll and select see all apps. From here, you have the option to select an app and make it the home app for your system. You will be able to do this with any of the apps on the menu, but you're gonna to wanna to select Daijisho. After selecting your home app, go ahead and open it up. From there, you're going to wanna to go to the app section and select Nova Launcher. If you long press the mouse button, it will let you select a different wallpaper. Now I've included about five wallpapers in here that you can choose from. And mainly the only time you're gonna see this is if you're in Nova Launcher or when you boot up. Once you've set your paper for your home screen and lock screen, go ahead and drag that menu back up. Let's go ahead and roll back into the front end. When you initially start this front end, it's going to ask you which systems you want to install. Just put a check mark next to the respective box and it will install those sub menus for you. To add games, you're going to click the paths button and go ahead and select the folder that you want to give the front end access to. This will simply be the ROM folder that coincides with each system or emulator that you plan on using. Once you've selected your pass, go ahead and click that little pencil down in the right hand corner. This will allow you to select your emulator. On the final setup, I am using RetroArch for all of these games and emulators, but I did want to show you guys that the Flycast and Redream APKs do run great on here. We're gonna take a quick look at the Flycast emulator to make sure that you guys understand how to properly set up your controls if you would like to use it, as well as one option that you should unselect, which is delay frame swapping. Make sure you unselect that. Then go ahead and go over to input. And for your controls, you're gonna to wanna to map the robot control. That's the one that will coincide with any of your control settings in any of these emulators. On a side note, it's important to understand that one of the apps that we installed, the Droid Fighter 2 player, is going to automatically start up every time you boot your machine. Real quick, let's talk about RetroArch and shaders. While you're in-game using RetroArch, press the FN and F1 key at the same time. This will take you into the quick menu and you wanna scroll down and select shaders. Make sure you enable the video shaders and then go to load shader presets. Select GLSL and then select the CRT folder. Scroll down until you get to ZFast CRT. From here, you can back out by pressing the backspace key and just make sure you save this in your core presets. That's the best looking shader and has the least impact on performance. That will apply it to any game that you're playing with that core. Now, if you prefer not to use shaders, then just ignore this part. Once you have saved, go ahead and quit the game and then start RetroArch just on its own by going into the app section of Daijisho and starting the app. Once you're back in RetroArch, use your left and right arrow keys to navigate the menu from home to settings and then go ahead and select input on the main menu for settings. Now, if you notice, I am in the player two controls, but this applies to both the first player and second player controls. We're gonna have to do two sets of button mapping. This first one is applicable specifically to the Naomi setup. Just follow the button pattern that I show you right here and it should work fine for you. Don't put anything for the select button because that's technically your coin button, which we're gonna use the live button as your coin button. And then your start button should just be the two player start button and then follow the rest of the pattern. Phew, okay, we're done with that. Believe it or not, that took me hours to figure out using the Droid Fighter. Once you've got both ports mapped, back out and go into the hotkey section. From there, from there, you're gonna wanna map quit to the live button. 
which means that you'll hold down the player two button and tap the live button twice to quit. Now let's boot into a game and go ahead and test out these two player controllers and make sure that they're working properly. Okay, it looks like everything is working good. Let's go ahead and check out our Naomi settings. In RetroArch for Naomi, there's an important setting that you wanna make sure you disable, which is gonna be DSP. So go ahead and boot up a Naomi game, go into the menu by pressing FN and F1, and go into the system sub menu and make sure you disable DSP. Once you've done that, go ahead and back out, go into the video menu. And in the video menu, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you disable fix upscale bleeding and anisotropic filtering. Under performance, a threaded rendering should be enabled. Your game should be running pretty smoothly. Now you might have a couple hiccups in between screens, but as far as the game goes itself, it will be running smoothly. Testing out the two player controls in Naomi, it looks like everything is running smoothly. Everything's set up the way it's supposed to be and all the buttons are mapped correctly. Now, moving into Dreamcast, it's gonna be a little bit different and you're going to have to set up a core map file specifically for Dreamcast games. Now remember, this is going off your master control setup, which is set up off of the Naomi control scheme. Just follow the letters that I do here, exactly how I do it, and you should be fine. Once you've done this, you will be able to use this control remap file for all of your emulators in RetroArch. Depending on what game you're playing, you might have to make a few adjustments depending on personal preferences, but this is the all around correct button scheme if you're applying it to any of the other fighting games. Once you finish remapping the buttons for the Dreamcast, you can either apply it to the game or you can save it as its own remap file. All right, now that we've saved our remap file, let's go ahead and back out. And we're gonna go into our other emulators and we're gonna make sure that we apply this remap file to those emulators and make any adjustments if we have to. Once you start each emulator, go ahead, go into the RetroArc menu and select load remap file. You can then save it for the core remap file, but make sure you go into the game and check to ensure that all the buttons are working properly. Again, this is for my fighting game build, so you might want to remap your buttons differently depending on what kind of games you plan on playing here, if not just fighting games. And it looks like everything's working the way that I want it to, which is good, so let's move on to CP2. So we'll quickly go through these other two systems and you're going to notice in CP2, I actually did have an issue with the fierce buttons not working. And so all I had to do was simply go into the menu and add those buttons in. If you followed this tutorial, you're most likely going to have to do the same thing. So here's the step by step on how to do it and you should be good. This will fix it for you. So it looks like everything is working good. Let's move on to CP1 and get this finished up. All I had to do here was apply the CP2 system remap file and I was good to go. So the same thing will apply to you if you're using this control scheme. So again, simply go into manage remap files and load up the saved CP2 scheme. And we are good to go. 
Now, as long as you've done everything like I showed you in this tutorial, you should be able to exit out, turn off your machine, and when you turn it back on, it will boot right into the front end and you will be able to select any game that you want to play. Almost like it came just from the factory like that. Scraping games and getting artwork is relatively simple, but it's not always accurate. So one thing you may be able to do is get DAT files from GitHub. I'm not gonna go into that in this tutorial because the main thing I wanted you guys to be able to see how to get the front end set up, game set up, and the two player controllers. Now that we're all set, let's go ahead and make a couple small adjustments. And just a quick reminder, one of the nice things about Daiji Show is that you can go into the app section and it has all of your apps right there if you wanna get into any of your settings or other apps that you have. From here, you can also add more platforms by clicking the download platforms button. So if you go to the library menu under settings, you can say sync all. Make sure that you have aggressive scraping turned on because that's gonna help get you the most artwork and file names. Now again, there are DAT files that you can use, but I'm not going to get into that but I'm just letting you know it's out there. Once you're done fully setting everything up, if you go into your navigation menu, you can select kiosk mode. This just basically gives it a simplified look. If you'd like to modify system themes or wallpapers, go to appearance. That's where you're gonna find all that stuff and most of it's downloadable. One more thing to point out about kiosk mode is that it doesn't allow for there to be any major editing going on which is nice if you have guests over or guests with kids because then they can't get into your emulation menu and screw with your emulators and then make games not playable. Last but not least, I just wanted to show you guys in Geekbench what the hardware of the system actually consists of. You can judge for yourself how powerful you think it is or how not powerful, but it does a pretty good job and it's a pretty decent chipset for what it is. The craziest part to me was finding out it only had one gigabyte of RAM. Well, that about does it for this tutorial. This was a very last minute video, so please forgive me if I left something out. Uh, feel free to leave a comment and let me know what you guys think of this mod or if you have any specific questions related to this tutorial. Obviously, I'm not going to tell you guys where to get ROMs and I'm sure that there are places like the Internet Archive that you guys can find a lot of what you need there. Wink, wink. I figured I'd end the video on a little bit of Naomi Power Stone. If you guys enjoyed this video or you found it really helpful, please make sure to leave a thumbs up. And if you're not subscribed, please consider subscribing. If you know anybody who's looking for something like this, please give this video a share. Technically, the cost of this whole project for me was $3.99 because that's what I picked this cab up for originally, and I didn't have to pay any extra to do this. Although they do go on sale for $2.99. Best budget solution? Let me know in the comments. Beat me.